This presentation is called Search for the Elusive Psychopath. My name is Frank Cardez. I served in law enforcement in Michigan, Arizona, and Hawaii. I supervised detectives and special agents responsible for taking into custody persons who had been deemed by the court as danger to others or dangers to themselves. I also commanded Internet Crimes Against Children Task Forces in Arizona and Hawaii and along the way encountered many types of sex offenders. The title psychopath has always been one of the most compelling labels that can be given to an offender, and this lecture simply explores the meaning of the word psychopath and related terms involving selected mental disorders. The learning objectives for this lecture are to define, discuss, and explain some of the noteworthy and often misunderstood terms related to mental illness, including psychopath, psychopathy, psychopathology, psychosis, psychotic disorder, psychotherapist, sociopath, disorder, disassociative disorder, clinically significant, and I'll also discuss some antipsychotic medications. The 1960 fictional horror movie titled Psycho helped to elevate the words psychopath and psychosis into our popular culture. The movie was not a documentary and did not chronicle a professional diagnosis of a mental disorder but it may have helped to contribute to some of the subsequent psychobabble surrounding mental illness. Subsequent movies in the horror genre depicted increasingly escalating graphic images of violence and mayhem often attributed to psychopaths, sociopaths, and other labels given to the offenders. If you're asking yourself why is this information useful, it is because understanding the languages of mental disorders helps us to prevent misunderstandings between providers in healthcare and justice systems and also assists us in reporting, courtroom testimony, and courtroom adjudication in both civil and criminal cases. These languages, diagnostic terms, words, and phrases are used by behavioral health professionals, social workers, medical insurance adjusters, drug companies, and providers to administer and obtain treatment, medications, and financial reimbursement. Civil and criminal law judges and lawyers use legal terms of art and phrases related to mental health for adjudicating and ordering treatment for persons with mental disorders. And for investigators of crimes and police officers in the field, it is about understanding the citizens they served based upon the languages of mental disorders. We are talking about the arena where mental health care meets criminal justice, and of course this is called forensic psychology. In the mental health field, they have patients and those patients suffer from disorders. In the criminal justice field, they have offenders and those offenders may commit crimes. Some of the information in this presentation comes from two books. One is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in the fifth edition, and the other is Black's Law Dictionary. The DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, provides guidance to mental health professionals, social workers, lawyers, judges, and others. And Black's Law Dictionary is simply geared towards the legal profession and provides explanations of various legal terms. Psychology, psychiatry, and the study of the human mind are inexact practices. In the U.S., we rely on the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for our definitions of mental disorders. But psychotherapist Gary Greenberg is quoted as saying, the DSM is created 
by a group of committees. It's a bureaucratic process in place of scientific findings and that the DSM uses expert consensus to determine what mental disorders exist and how you can recognize them. There are some further criticisms of the DSM and I won't go into those too much in this lecture, perhaps in a future lecture. The Physician's Desk Reference and the Urban Dictionary. The Physician's Desk Reference, the PDR, is useful in identifying drugs that are used to treat various mental illnesses. And the Urban Dictionary is useful for interpreting slang words and phrases that may be unfamiliar to the clinician. Danger to others is one of the legal categories associated with persons who have mental disorders wherein they demonstrate threatening behavior. Here is an excerpt from the Arizona Revised Statutes defining danger to others. The law states in part, the judgment of a person who has a mental disorder is so impaired that the person is unable to understand the need for treatment and as a result of the disorder, the person's continued behavior can reasonably be expected to result in serious physical harm. Definitions like this can be found in the law books of many states and are used for the purpose of court ordering persons suffering from mental disorders into state custody when they are believed to be dangerous. The Free Dictionary, which describes a lot of slang words, defines the word psychobabble. Psychobabble is obfuscating language and jargon as used by psychoanalysts and psychiatrists, characterized by complex phrases and are psychopathology. Psychopathology is simply the study of psychological and behavioral dysfunction occurring in mental illness or in social disorganization. Disorder is defined as a clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion regulation, or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological, or developmental processes. Mental disorders are usually associated with significant distress or disability in social, occupational, or other important activities. A disorder is not an expectable or culturally approved response to a common stressor or loss, such as the death of a loved one. So for example, we are expected to feel some distress when we lose a loved one, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are suffering from a disorder. Clinically significant. When is a disorder clinically significant? One of the thresholds that clinicians use to determine whether or not someone suffers from a mental disorder involves the term clinically significant. But Dr. Francis states that Clinically significant is a necessarily vague term with no precise markers. Deciding whether you are experiencing enough distress or impairment to have a clinically significant mental disorder can inherently be a tough and subjective judgment that has to be made without objective criteria. The next few slides will discuss some information that comes directly from the fifth edition of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Disruptive Impulse Control and Conduct. One of the many sections of the DSM-5 covers a group of disorders that fall under the category titled Disruptive Impulse Control and Conduct. And these disorders describe problems in the self-control of emotions and behaviors. So behaviors that violate the rights of others, including aggression, destruction of property, and behaviors that bring the individual into significant conflict with societal norms or authority figures, including law-breaking. Those are all part of the category that DSM calls disruptive 
impulse control and conduct and we will discuss some of those subcategories now. Under this broad category of disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders we have aggression, fighting, weapons use, arson and fire setting, animal cruelty, theft, and burglary type offenses. Disassociative disorder is characterized by a disruption of and or discontinuity in the normal integration of consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, body representation, motor control, and behavior. The symptoms may disrupt every area of psychological functioning in a person. These disorders include disassociative identity disorder, disassociative amnesia, depersonalization, derealization disorder. Now we come to psychotic disorder, which is not to be confused with psychopath. Psychotic disorder involves reality testing. The accuracy and perceptions and thoughts are incorrectly evaluated and incorrect inferences about external reality are made by the patient, even in the face of contrary evidence. Patient will have delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, thought, or behavior, and individuals may have little insight into their symptoms. Examples of this include schizophrenia, delusional disorder, brief psychotic disorder, and psychotic disorders due to substance abuse. Psychotic behaviors associated with psychosis include delusions, hallucinations, and formal thought disorder. The statement, I reject your reality and substitute my own, originates from the 1984 movie Dungeon Masters and was popularized by Adam Savage of Mythbusters but that statement kind of exemplifies the delusional thought process that a psychotic person might be experiencing. By now you may be asking yourself, where does the psychopath fit into all of this since I titled the lecture Search for the Elusive Psychopath? How did the word psychopath come to be associated with mental disorders? Well, Hurstein discusses the evolution and I'm going to call it de-evolution of the word psychopath. In 1900 or so, dangerous people were labeled as psychopaths. By 1930, that word was associated and replaced in some circles with the word sociopaths because sociopaths was used to associate the dangers of those individuals with their dangers to society. Around 1970, Dr. Robert Hare devised the psychopath checklist, which we will discuss shortly. But by 1913, with the fifth edition of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, psychopath and sociopath were not found in the manual. So those are no longer terms of art used for diagnostic purposes. So you'll still hear the word psychopath and sociopath bantered about, but for specific diagnostic use by clinicians, psychopath and sociopath are not recognized disorders. What is the definition of psychopath? Although we will not find that word in the DSM, According to the American Heritage Dictionary, a psychopath is a person with an antisocial personality disorder manifested in aggressive, perverted, criminal, or amoral behavior without empathy or remorse. Merriam-Webster defines psychopath as a mentally ill or unstable person, especially a person affected with antisocial personality disorder. According to Merriam-Webster, synonyms include bug, crack brain, crazy, fool, fruitcake, head case, loon, loony, lunatic, maniac, and nut, nutcase, nutter, which apparently is British slang, 
Psycho, Sicky, Sicko, and Wacko. This brings us to findacode.com. Every medical illness and USA recognized mental disorder has an ICD code. ICD stands for International Classification of Diseases and it covers everything from a hangnail, medically known as acute lymphangitis, to brain tumor, malignant neoplasm of the brain. The codes are useful to medical practitioners and insurance companies for identifying conditions and for billing patients. At the website www.findacode.com, you can type in a medical condition and there is a high likelihood that you will find the associated ICD code. That is, except for psychopath and sociopath. Those two are not listed. As we move from medicine to law, we can search for legal terms and definitions at law.com. But in the world of statutes, legislation, and courtrooms, the words psychopath and sociopath are also not terms of art. At law.com, the word psychopath is not defined. Despite its exclusion from the DSM, we still hear the word psychopath bantered about. But what is the difference between a psychopath, again, not a recognized DSM disorder, and the psychotic, where a psychotic is a recognized DSM disorder? According to Schapp, psychopath is a mental disorder that includes a lack of empathy among its many symptoms. It's currently known as antisocial personality disorder and is often correlated with criminal behavior and a refusal to follow societal rules. And he says psychosis, being psychotic, is a mental disorder that includes delusions, hallucinations, and a disconnection with reality. Now going back to the ICD codes, there are ICD codes for antisocial personality disorder so psychopath, if it is defined under antisocial personality disorder, is a billable condition. Not all psychopaths are criminals. There's an interesting video that can be found on YouTube titled, In the Shadow of Feeling, a Psychopath Documentary. In the video, they state that psychopathic individuals often hold important posts in society, such as business, corporate, politics, and military. According to the video, although many of them will never commit actual crimes, they still leave an unmistakable mark on the people around them and a wake of broken promises and broken hearts everywhere they go. What is the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? According to Robinson, a psychopath doesn't have a conscience. If he lies to you so he can steal your money, he won't feel any moral qualms, though he may pretend to. He may observe others and then act the way they do so that he's not found out. And Robinson says, a sociopath typically has a conscience, but it's weak. He may know that taking your money is wrong, and he might feel some guilt or remorse, but that won't stop the behavior. Here's a case based on a news report of a homicide. For law enforcement officers, particularly those who must make post-arrest statements to the media, and particularly before a case is adjudicated, they should probably avoid making what may be perceived as a medical diagnosis of mental disorders. In a Florida case, a young man strangled his mother and then moved and hid the body. After the arrest, the sheriff described the suspect as a sociopath. While that statement may be a correct one, critics will argue that the sheriff is not medically qualified to make a diagnosis and the legal community may say that such a statement could taint a potential jury pool 
and further a possible insanity defense. An interesting test, a psychopathy test, was developed by Robert Hare. It's called the Robert Hare PCL-R, with the R standing for revised from its original version. It contains two parts, a semi-structured interview and a review of the subject's file records and history. The test should be administered by a qualified clinician under scientifically controlled conditions. The test covers a number of attributes attributable to a psychopath, including whether or not the person is glib and superficially charming, grandiose, has a need for stimulation, is a liar, is manipulative, lacks remorse, has a shallow affect, is callous and lacks empathy, has a parasitic lifestyle, has poor behavioral controls. The test asks questions about sexual promiscuity, early behavioral problems, long-term goals, impulsivity, irresponsibility, accepting responsibility, short-term marital relationships, juvenile delinquency, revocation of conditional release, for example, from parole or probation, and criminal versatility. Dutton wrote an interesting book called The Wisdom of Psychopaths, What Saints, Spies, and Serial Killers Can Teach Us About Success. And he discusses functional psychopaths who are different from their murderous counterparts. These are people who use charismatic personalities to succeed in society. And in some fields, according to Dutton and the research, the more psychopathic people are, the more likely they are to succeed. And some of those occupations could include surgeons, soldiers, police, firefighters, and world leaders. The science of neurochemistry and studies of possible chemical imbalances in the brain began in the late 1950s and has progressed to a point where there are now many treatments that involve medications intended to treat various mental disorders. There's an ongoing nature versus nurture debate about whether antisocial or psychotic psychopath behavior is inborn or a learned behavior. Brain studies point to the prefrontal cortex as an area of concern for some of the behavioral problems. The physician's desk reference is an informative resource for finding out about antipsychotic medications. There are dozens of medications used to treat psychosis and other psychological conditions. First responders should have some awareness of those medications. In my law enforcement work, it was common to find someone who had a mental illness but was either not taking their medication because they did not like it, or they had mixed their medication with drugs or alcohol, resulting in some behavior that brought them to the attention of law enforcement. So to wrap up this lecture, I discussed and explained some of the noteworthy and often misunderstood terms related to mental illness. In this lecture, I searched for the elusive psychopath, but I'm not sure whether or not I succeeded in that endeavor. But as I learned, the word psychopath, according to the DSM-5, is not a recognized disorder. And the word is likely avoided in some medical and legal settings, although it is closely associated with antisocial personality. And the word psychopath is still widely used in popular culture and by professionals outside of clinical diagnosis and legal settings. Here are some online dictionaries and resources that might be useful to you in researching if you have a continuing interest in this subject. These are current as of early 2019, so I don't know if they'll still be around at the time that you view this video. There is an interesting video available on YouTube called Psychopaths, 
It's a crime psychology documentary. And in that video, they say that psychopaths make up about 20% of the prison population and are four times more likely to reoffend than other released prisoners, yet they are just as likely to get parole. Another interesting video, if you have 12 minutes to spare, is called Narcissist, Psychopath, or Sociopath. How to spot the differences. And finally, here's the test. See if you can find 14 words from this presentation in this word search puzzle.